We're getting closer, aren't we? We're getting ever closer. I, f- I genuinely feel like this international break has gone on much, much longer than I ever in my wildest dreams expected it to. It's, I don't know if it's the fact that I'm now writing and that means that the things are just sort of slowing it down and trying to find things to talk about and write about. But finally, of course, we have received our Arteta's press conference giving us insight into our questions about Partey and what Kieran Tierney might be doing in this game and some thoughts on some interesting sort of kind of football politics uh, surrounding Project um, project Restart and Big Six and all of these sort of things. So it's going to be interesting to see um, what he said and we're going to break all of it down right now. Hello and welcome to the Guna Talk. Back again with you guys for another show, for another episode of our Raw Reaction series, show in which we react to the latest Arsenal news and get your thoughts in our live chat as well. Thank you ever so much, people, for tuning in. Uh, almost ready for the party, says Daniel. Yes, Tom says, oh my, hello, uh, Joseph. Thank you ever so much for tuning in. Uh, Abigi, thank you ever so much for tuning in to Goat Party uh, from Zamir. is certainly talking about the goat that is, I mean, in my opinion, it's Pierre Emerick Aubameyang, but uh, Thomas Partey, I'm sure, will fall very quickly into that category as well. Apologies for the short notice on the show as well. I've just had a bit of a, a crazy evening, it's fair to say. So uh, let's jump straight into things and talk about Arteta's press conference in which he was uh, conducting today, still in the socially distanced times, away from reporters through Zoom, which is how we pretty much communicate with everyone these days. So let's jump into this and talk about uh, Arteta and what he was saying. So he was asked about Thomas Partey and he talked about, he was asked about how he was integrating and what we could likely expect from the Ghanaian head of Uh, the weekend and he said well he was here just yesterday he's getting familiar with everything around the club today he will have his first training session so everything has to come really quickly for him we knew that this before we signed him that if he's already fit of course and he's willing to start playing and we will see how it goes in the next few days and that's really key um and I'd, i'd like the fact that he's talked about it in such a positive way saying that he's already fit we know that and that he was ready to play and sort of seeing how he will do over the next few days is dependent on where and how he will play. I just is it is it just me or is it just still seem really unreal? Like I just can't quite picture still Thomas Partey in Arsenal's midfield. And usually what happens is when we sign players, we have a bit of a preseason. We're able to see kind of these players in preseason. And when you sign players completely out of the blue, and it's a bit like Mesa Urzil when he signed. And of course, he came into that game. I think it was against Sunderland, Mesa Urzil's first game away from home, the yellow and blue kit with the collar. Um and he set up Olivier Giroud um, on his first on his debut to get an assist. Of course, as we've got an assist on his debut, um, and it just I just can't still quite picture it. I just I don't know what it is. Let me know in the chat box if you've got that same kind of feeling. I just can't yet picture Thomas Partey in Arsenal's midfield. It's really strange. It's it's the dream signing that I never thought we'd get. Uh, just it's just really really weird jared says not to overreact but i'll be absolutely devastated if we don't have Partey or tierney in the starting lineup and one of the biggest things about this arsenal city game in my mind is is one of the biggest opportunities that we've had in a long time to try and go away to one of the biggest six teams and win now you'd think that, that would be against united or spurs or um or chelsea or not so much liverpool of course but it's weird to think that City look the most vulnerable right now, along with, with I think, Chelsea as well. And you look at, obviously, the result against Leicester and how that was really kind of an, an oddball result. And I'm going to talk more about the City game in the preview in tomorrow's show. But I just think that it's important that we see Thomas Partey play in this game. Hello, people, for tuning in. Addicted92, thank you ever so much, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. Afternoon, Top Techers. Good afternoon, Jonathan. Afternoon, Jared. Thank you ever so much, guys, for tuning in. So let's carry on and talk about a little bit more about what Arteta has been saying. He says, on how long it takes the players to adapt to the Premier League, he says, I think it is something very individual, depending on many, uh, depending on many factors, how they will settle here. 
uh, in the city with their family, whether they speak the language or not, whether their qualities fit the team and the Premier League more straight away or if they need some adaption and some development in those areas. It is very uh, particular that you see some players adapt really quickly and some others taking a long time. And I think we've seen players like Lacazette, like Pepe, take a little bit of time before they kind of adjusted. And you've seen other players like Gabriel that's come straight in, Alexis Sanchez, of course, and Ozil to a lesser extent that did come in and just transitioned immediately and just carried on with what they were doing really well at the time. And I think that it depends on types of players. And Partey just looks to be one of those players that would transition much easier. He's already in his prime. He's very experienced. He you knows playing at the top, top level of the game with Atletico Madrid. And I just think that when you've got someone like him in your team, he hopefully won't need too much time to adapt. He's also played against plenty of Premier League oppositions in the Champions League in Europe and in the Europa League too. So I think that hopefully we won't need to see too much of a transition for the likes of Thomas Partey. In terms of how excited Arteta is, he says, I have seen the buzz around the place. The fans are really happy. I've seen some really positive reactions after we bought him. The same with the team, the squad and the staff. I think he is a player we had on the radar for a long time and we managed to bring him in and I think he will be a really important addition to the team and on how the confidence of the squad has been he says that i am confident in what we are doing it's very early to say where we will be at the end of the season a lot of things have to happen a lot of improvement has to be made by us as a team we know what we have to do we know the level competition we are facing in this league we are happy with the recruitment we have done and now we need to get better and better every week. And just finally on Partey, he says, very good in terms of how he has settled in. He hasn't trained with us yet. He will have his first training session today, being Wednesday, Thursday, Thursday. Um, but he got to know some of his teammates, not all of them, because some are still on international duty. But we will have everyone back today and it will be a good day for him to get to know everyone. And like, I know that a lot of people get very frustrated with sort of things about like language, but the fact that Thomas Pye is an English speaker is great. Like, it's really good to see that he's an English speaker and obviously Ghana is an English speaking country. So of course he is going to be speaking English, but we've had a lot of players come in that struggle with communication. We've had a manager come in in Unai Emery that struggled with communication. And I think that is really key. And talking about the communication between the likes of Gabriel and David Luiz, who of course both speak Portuguese, being Brazilian. So that communication is going to be good. Just making sure that clear uh, that clear and direct sort of language barriers aren't broken down. But that was never going to be a problem with Partey, which is, of course, really great. And he speaks Spanish as well. So he's got that link between some of the Spanish-speaking players that can't necessarily speak English yet. So I'm trying to think who that would be. Um, Danny Sabas doesn't speak... I don't think he's fluent in English, for sure. And, of course, he will speak Spanish being Spanish. So he'll have that connection and that ability to communicate with him too. So that's important. And then that's important going forward as well. So 100%. Um, let's have a look at what you guys have been saying in the chat about that. Clarence says, Partey hasn't trained with the team, so he won't start. I mean, he has been playing international football. And I've seen players come in with less time in training. I still think there's a chance that we could see him start. Top Tecker says, for me, Partey has to start and he doesn't need to be protected like Arteta did with Gabriel against Liverpool, for instance. Um, not harsh, in my opinion. Uh, <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of criticism. Kalasadach popping up all of a sudden. Omar says, Partey has to start. Clarence doesn't think that he will. Daniel certainly thinks that he will start, but he's not prepared to see Mares against Kalasanach, which I can completely understand. Wesley says, never been this excited about a new player. Can't wait to see him. Let's scroll on and get some more thoughts on the press conference. So, in terms of the Sheffield United game, I think it will be a completely different game. City's approach when they play us will be very different to Sheffield's. Very different demands for what we have to do with the with and without the ball, of course. I'm really happy with the way that we have managed to win this game and how patient we were. And in the improvements compared with last year against this type of opposition. But again, we know the level of difficulty at Manchester City will be on a different plane of existence is probably the better way to describe it. And in terms of how City have started the season, he said they are still producing incredible numbers in everything that they are doing. In my opinion, they have been really unlucky with some of the results that they got because they should have put games to bed very early on, very early on in those games. And then the level of efficiency of the opponents when they had half chances have punished them uh, publish them punish them i think that means to say but i haven't seen any decrease in the level of the way they are playing or in what they are producing game by game and i haven't seen any of that 
whatsoever. And it always comes down to when you look at Arteta coming up against Pep Guardiola, those comparisons get made all the time. They get made continuously between those two because Arteta, of course, played, not played, but coached with Pep Guardiola. So on that, he says, I don't know about better. I know him very well because we worked together for four years very closely. We both know how we think and the solutions that can be made. But after it is to try to prevent them or execute the football on the pitch when everything is going 100 miles an hour, which is very difficult and much more difficult than on tactics boards. And on Project Big Picture, which is this, re- I haven't covered it. Because one, I don't think I'm, I don't think I've looked into it enough to really get my head around it. I'm not, I've got a friend of mine who's an Ipswich fan, uh, who's very, very, very anti uh, Project Big Picture. I need to have a look into it more. But in terms of what he said on it, he says, "Well, I think it was a very clear statement from the Premier League about what is going to happen. We all have to review the actual context and how we will." help each other to make football more sustainable. But I think it has to be agreed by everybody. And yesterday's statement was very clear regarding that. And whether Big Picture could have damaged our relationship with other clubs. He says, well, I don't think so. I think it's very special the way the Premier League has conducted itself over the years. I think that's a massive strength. So as much as we can, we can maintain that unity and sustain our way of doing things. I think that's very valuable. And the image that we project to the outside of the world is really, really strong. I hope that we can maintain that. Um, it's an interesting one because I haven't covered it in terms of like thinking about the, the price and the cost of of paying for these games. And I think it's a ridiculous price that you're asking fans to pay. I really, That's my honest opinion. I think fourteen ninety five for a single game when people are paying around £18 a month for these subscription in England, specifically, of course, outside of England, things are very, very different. It's, it's just a bit crazy. Like, it's just... It's just insane um, to be paying nearly a month subscription for one match, which in a single month you could have more than one of those games. And we're very lucky as Arsenal fans from that perspective that we actually, of course, get quite a lot of our games because Arsenal games draw in the most uh, viewers on average. Arsenal are one of the highest viewed uh, teams in, in the Premier League. And so Arsenal are obviously prioritised amongst other teams when they're doing the schedule of who gets what games in, who goes to BT Sport and Sky Sports and Amazon and BBC and etc. So Arsenal are very lucky, but for other teams that are now going to have to pay really high amounts of money. And I, I saw a really strange comment that was about like fans pay 30 quid for a ticket to go to grounds. Why is there this complaint about paying 15 quid to go watch a game on your telly? Well, I'm sorry, but if you paid... If you paid like 30 quid to go watch something in the theater or 100 quid to go watch something in the theater, you're not going to pay half of that money, 50 quid to watch it on telly, are you? You're not going to watch it because you expect it to be included. And this kind of comes down to the Premier League should really have their own streaming service. Now, I'm not a big fan of streaming in terms of like it being streamed onto a laptop because the streams are always behind um, you get lag with with your Wi-Fi and your internet connection. I'd rather it was just streamed in in terms of its own channel. But at the same time, if the Premier League did have their own streaming service, you'd expect that hopefully there would be more like there'd be a better um, sort of fan side of things. You get a better price for what you're watching. The Premier League would make more money than just selling off the rights to Sky. It would be massively detrimental to the to the TV companies like Sky, like BT Sport, who rely on being the main covers of this sort of, or the main coverage for these sports. And you look at that and you think all the people that are working there, the jobs that would be affected. And I do consider those things because it would be a massive hit to those industries. And maybe those people would find jobs working in the Premier League. Um, But it would be massively detrimental to the likes of BT and Sky if the Premier League did come up with their own streaming service. I don't know how that will go down. I don't know how that would affect foreign markets as well because I'm not in tune with that side of things. But you would have to think that they could possibly have their own channel. I mean, Vinny, you says that nothing would stop them from having their own channel. So you wouldn't have to like stream it. But I don't know how it would affect um, these other companies, other countries, other nations, other projects and, and concepts. I don't know how it would affect all those things. But it's all boils down to fans once again are being milked for the amount of money that they pay to use these subscriptions to watch these games and it's just 
it is a case of fans being taken advantage of, unfortunately, again. And it's a really, really big shame to see that happening. I'm, I don't know who decides these. Um, it's just it's a group of people that decide that. Um, I, I, I'm not in favour of going... I, like, I don't, it's not a ba- like a case of you criticising Sky Sports and BT Sport because there's a lot of people that work within those companies that have nothing to do with the pricing of the project of, of the product. Is there a specific group of people that decide these things in the in the marketing sector or the, the analytics? I'm not an expert, but I'm not going to attack Sky Sports and BT Sport for that. It is the people? It is a, a select group of people within those companies that have decided that's how much we want to charge. And that's who you should be aiming your criticism at because, again, it is a case of... Um, it's a case of just, you know, unfortunately, milking fans what they're worth. Top Tecker says, Project Big Picture is elitist uh, and allows the big six to become stronger and powerful while no other club can reach that level, having Leicester and Blackburn winning the Premier League is what footy is about. Of course, there I'm, I'm not sure where we deviate between Project Big Picture and then the 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 trying to get the what's the word subsidy of funds from there being a lack of fans in stadiums i think they are two different things i probably spoke about it completely wrong um but i've not again read it too much into project big picture in terms of how it affects the lower league clubs how it gives the advantage to the top six teams i mean from an arsenal perspective you'd be like yeah it's great arsenal are, are prioritized or whatever if, even if you class arsenal because if you look at the likes of leicester and wolves and everton that are growing you would have a case to say Arsenal haven't been a big top six club. Like, are Arsenal technically a top six club at this point? Because we finished outside of that last season. The whole big six is just down to history. And then you have to turn around and say that, well, Manchester City are a fairly new club. Aston Villa are technically, historically, Nottingham Forest are historically a bigger club. West Ham, possibly even, are historically a bigger club than Manchester City. So... This big six is completely turned around to be this modern day thing, which is always going to take precedence because of money and streaming and people's viewership uh, and the way that clubs are richer than others. But it's just, it's a crazy scenario to think that clubs would be getting prioritized. I wouldn't like to see a situation like we see in Spain, for instance, where the money that goes to Barcelona and Real Madrid in comparison to the likes of Leganes, Atafe, um, the, the, the sort of smaller clubs in Spain is so disproportionate across the league. It's crazy the disproportionate amount of money that is spread. You look at the Premier League and how the sort of the money is given out at the end of the season. It's based upon like where you finished. It's fairly like evenly spread out um, in terms of like the, the, the team at the top getting the most, and then it's gradually a fairly even interval going down the league. But in Spain, it's completely different. And you look at the likes of Barcelona and Real Madrid that have profited massively of just being that big and being these hyper clubs playing in a league where they out-dwarf these smaller sides in terms of the league. And it's it's gradually, you just create the gap, becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And it comes down to these clubs having to work on their academies, working on bringing these te- these players through from the youth setup. You look at some of the teams that have managed to do that. You look at some of the teams within Spain that have managed to grow these youth talents to, to really great levels and see these young players go on and do really well. And then you look at other examples like Sevilla, for instance. Sevilla changed their team almost every season. The amount of transfers that they do over in Seville is crazy. And they're able to do that because they finish higher up the league. But you look at other teams that end up dropping down into the lower divisions. You look at Deportivo. Um, Las Palmas had a very sort of swan song in La Liga and now dropped down again. Espanyol, who are my personal Spanish team, I have a lot of fear for. Espanyol last season managed to qualify for the Europa League. And then this season they were, or last season just gone, they were relegated. And it's, it's, it's a lot down to the how the finances are spread out and the poor management and the poor ownership. Espanol in particular were taken over by a Chinese consortium and were promised all this big wages, big money, big signings. And they spent really a lot of money on wasted, on wasted potential and some really odd signings that you have to think if they had a really good, strong setup of recruitment, that wouldn't have happened. And they just invested money really, really poorly. And I don't want to see the small clubs in England suffer the same way. I have a lot of time for watching the lower leagues. I, I watched the lower leagues on a personal level. As a, I had a season ticket at Gillingham because at the time we couldn't afford to go and watch the Arsenal week in, week out. And Gillingham was the local side that that we I was going to see because you could have we could afford to go and watch them. But while still being Arsenal through and through, but I love football. I love watching football, and and that was the best way to kind of connect to 
to sort of football in sort of being there because we couldn't access the Premier League because it was just too expensive for the, the financial situation that I happened to be in as a child. So I don't want to lose that connection with the lower leagues. I love the fact that when you see the giant killings and you see, as you said there earlier on, Vinny, I think it was saying that it's all about the, the Blackburns and the Leicesters that get their chance to win the league. And you won't see that anymore because it's going to be so ridiculously skewed in the big team's favours. And that would be a really big shame to kind of lose that romanticism, I suppose, about sort of things. Um, let's uh, jump on to the last little bit that I want to talk about before we wrap things up, and that is on Kieran Tierney. Of course, we all know the information about Kieran Tierney that supposedly looks like he can't play. Um, but this is what I, t- I had to say when he was asked upon. He says, this is getting very complicated when we are sending players abroad, and obviously you lose control. Some authorities have different regulations to the actual ones in the Premier League. We are still having some discussions with the authorities, and hopefully we will know more this afternoon. I cannot discuss individual medical things when he was asked about Tierney testing positive earlier in the summer and on whether Tierney could play this weekend. I hope so. Now, I have to say that I don't think Arsenal are completely innocent. And there was a video that came out yesterday that did frustrate me a little that the fact that the club even put it out in the first place. A lot of you may have seen the behind the scenes video of Thomas Partey at Arsenal. Now, there is a clip in that where you see Abamyang and Lacazette approach Thomas Partey. It cuts and then it goes to Aubameyang and Lacazette walking away from Thomas Partey. Now, it doesn't take a genius to work out what what would have happened in that little clip. Now, it's important as sometimes as Arsenal fans that you have to remain as kind of level-headed as possible and be critical of the right things. And I don't think they should have showed that. I don't think they should have showed that at all because it made it very obviously clear that social distancing was probably broken there. And whilst Arsenal can be very frustrated that Kieran Tierney is going to, probably going to miss this game, even though he maintained the social distance, as we are told, so then there's a little, there's just a little bit of hypocrisy. And I don't like that. Um, I, I want Arsenal to be as legitimate as feasibly possible. And I just, you know, I just got, I couldn't not feel that I couldn't bring that up without talking about Tierney in a frustrating way. Because it is, it's frustrating to see that. I think we all, we could all see, if you haven't seen that, video of behind the scenes of Partey, watch it. It's very, very obvious that, that there has been an, an editing thing go on there. We're not idiots. I don't know if we've, we're being treated like we're idiots to expect that we wouldn't notice that, but it's it still should be. And Daniel says, isn't there an Arsenal bubble? There's an Arsenal bubble, Daniel, but players and people are still meant to maintain social distancing at all times where possible. So that's that's key at the end of the day. Because you could, whilst there's a bubble, you still go home and you mix with your family, you still have to go shopping to get your food. And at that point, anything can happen during that period. So you should still maintain, to the best of your ability, social distancing. Speaking from someone who's in a school for two more days, um, social distancing is, is meant to be put in place as much as feasibly possible. You're in technically like a teaching bubble, effectively, because you're all staff or whatever, but you still maintain that social distancing as much as possible. You're not within two metres of someone where possible. Um, And when you're looking over and you're seeing two people walk together to do a handshake, unfortunately, the times that we're in right now, it's not ideal. It's just not. Um, So they're basically jumping all over each other during games and the celebrations. Yes, and I don't agree with it, Dan. I, I don't agree with it. I think that you should follow guidelines. If there are guidelines in place, they should be followed. Um, so it doesn't make, you're right. Science says it doesn't make no sense because they play on Saturday and then they celebrate. So I completely agree with you. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't, but where you can, it's not a case of old oh, because it's fine to celebrate. It shouldn't be fine to celebrate. Um, and I know it's boring and I know it's, <laughs> I know I sound like a right bored by saying that. And like, you want to see, um, your teammates celebrate together, but in this situation, like there are a lot of people that are suffering and I think that you should be maintaining a distance where possible. And unfortunately that's not happened there. And like we, you can all say like it's boring or whatever, but they still edited that, that out. But if they, if they, if they didn't think that something was wrong, they wouldn't have edited that little clip out. Like it was very obvious what happened. So righty and Partey look socially distanced. And that's another thing is that righty of course, isn't in that bubble. I don't think, but he's going into that environment still. So CR7 got COVID, you got to be careful. And that's another thing. And that kind of clashes with the whole uh, Kieran Tierney thing is that Kieran Tierney was socially distanced supposedly from Stuart Armstrong at all times. But Cristiano Ronaldo, 
goes to Portugal, contracts COVID, and none of any of the other players have had to uh, go into a sort of a social distancing or a self isolation. Um, so it is. It's it's just a bit crad. It's just it's just. I just don't really get it. I don't really understand how it's one rule for one thing, another rule for another thing. I know that they're different countries, but they're coming back to play in the same country. It's just a bit strange. It's just a bit strange, isn't it? Um, Rush, uh, Rashawn says you cannot social distance on the pitch, celebration or not. It's not that big of a deal. And the thing is, like. You say it's not that big of a deal, but where you can distance, you should distance. That is just the bottom line. That is why press conferences are virtual. That is why um, on the pitch, it's it's there's no handshakes. That people wear masks as we- wherever possible. Like it is a big deal. This situation is a big deal, and I don't buy into a lot of people saying that these like masks are rubbish. I don't want to go down a political route, really. Uh, I didn't plan to do it today, but. It, sh- it's, it should be kept socially distanced where possible if they're the rules you're going to put in place. If the rules change, it's a different story. But in my opinion, those guidelines are there for a reason and they should be followed where possible. That's why I get annoyed when Kieran Tinney gets punished when he has maintained a social distance and yet there's a hypocrisy because you see the edited video. So that's just my thoughts. Like you, And everyone's entitled to their opinion. And I'm not going to tell you and say you're an idiot for having a different opinion to me. I'm never going to do that unless you're abusive. <laughs> but it's just my opinion. It's just my opinion at the end of the day. If you disagree with it, fair play to you. I respect that. But it's just my view. Um, was there anything else on... Oh, for goodness sake. There isn't a show we can't do without Mesa Ozil being discussed in some way. He was discussed on it. He wasn't the only one who was not in the Europa League squad. It is a really difficult decision for me to make because to leave players out of the squad at that level where they know they cannot get involved, it is really tough. I don't like it at all, but the decision has been made because we have an excess of foreign players. Unfortunately, we had to make that decision. Arsene Wenger said that Mesut Ozil should be more involved, and he says, I think you have to try and find a way to feed every player with their own qualities, and this is our job, and obviously our responsibility with all the players we have to manage. Oh, it's just <laughs> when are we going to start talking about Mesut Ozil? Like we know that he's leaving at the end of this year. We know that. We know that he's going to be gone. He's going to be gone, and so we don't need to talk about it. He's not going to be included. Twentieth. The last time I plan to talk about Mesut Ozil, unless there is some big, big news, is the twentieth of October, when we finally see the Premier League squads of the teams laid out on the line. If he's in it, there's a lot to talk about, and we will discuss him further. If he's not in it, that's the only news you need to talk about. And from that point on, you can pretty much assume that Mesut Ozil is not going to take any further part in Arsenal until he leaves. And, and I mean, that's it. Vinny Eagle says, Tom, have you read slash listened to Arsene Wenger's book? I haven't. It is right here. And I am looking to read it at some point. All signed. And it, oh, it's nice, isn't it? Well, I did think it's quite funny. A little Arsene Wenger signature just there. There you go. Um, I'm going to get around to reading it at some point. Obviously, I'll finish teaching tomorrow so i'll have a lot more time on my hands to get around to reading slash listening i was tempted the other day i was saying to the boys in the chat books i was saying um <laughs> i might read it with the audiobook with arsene wenger reading it to me that might that might be quite nice uh, <laughs> so that's the plan what's your opinion on miguel aziz says abby uh yes he's a fantastic talent can't wait to see what he does a hundred percent um so that's i'm gonna finish things there because i've gone on way longer than i wanted to um but thank you ever so much for tuning in people if you could drop a like on the video i'd really appreciate it. if you could sign up and subscribe i'd also appreciate that and if you want to become a member and join this wonderful group of people our expert members plus our plus members and our tg2 members too i'd really appreciate that there's chances to come on the show you get exclusive content you get to use emojis in the chat box which our members are now going to display to you now off you go members get those emojis going and of course thank you to our tgt ambassadors janice alex gary brian cole owen aaron jared three points rohit ed matt and jimmy thank you so much guys for the continuing support you are awesome so thank you so much for tuning in people we will see you very very soon tomorrow for the preview of the manchester city game with our predicted lineups and my predicted 11 with our tetas predicted 11 as well other than that it's been a pleasure to speak to you as it always is and as always up the arsenal (laughs) 